Good morning, kind people of the internet. Today I want to talk a little bit about what it's like to be an adjunct music teacher at a couple of universities. So I'm hoping this video will give you a little bit of insight if you are somebody who's interested in pursuing this type of work, or if you're just curious what it's like, or if maybe you're an up and coming music student and you really want to teach at the college level, um, or if you're currently looking for these types of jobs, um, I just want to share my experience and just share the knowledge and hopefully you'll get something out of it. I live in Indianapolis and I'm currently teaching at two different schools. So I'm teaching at Butler University and I'm teaching at Indiana University. I'm just teaching one class at each school and luckily they happen to fall at different times so I'm able to do both. So this is basically what my schedule looks like for these schools. So on Monday and Wednesday, I go down to Bloomington, Indiana, um, which is 50 miles south of Indianapolis. And the class there is from 12.20 to 1.10. And for the Butler class, that is on Fridays from 11.30 a.m. to 1 p.m. So Butler is actually really close to where I live. It takes me, if there's no traffic, it takes me seven minutes to get there. So that's definitely a perk. Um, for IU, it takes me about an hour and 20 minutes to get there, uh, which turns out is not such a terrible thing, especially when I figured out that I can um, stream podcasts through my car and obviously I can listen to music too. So the IU class is Improvisation 1 for non-jazz majors. So the majority of the students are master's level classical performance majors and then there are some undergrad as well and then some doctoral students also. So the great thing about it is that they are all really good at playing their instruments, they have really good ears, and since they signed up for the class, they're really hungry to learn how to improvise or improvise better if they have some experience. And the Butler class is um, just a jazz combo and it's just uh, five students and most of them are undergrad jazz studies majors. Then I think we have one grad student who's a music major and then one undergrad student who's a non-music major. One of the good things with the IU class though is that the travel is actually paid for as well and I'll talk a little bit more about that later on in the video. Um, but basically if I'm heading to Bloomington I'll usually leave around 10 or 10 15 a.m. Um, which gets me there around 11 30 a.m. which gives me plenty of time to park. Parking hasn't really been an issue there. I found one garage that I've been able to park in pretty consistently now. Um, so yeah, it gives me plenty of time to relax and not have to rush into class and I can get there, turn on some music, set up the room. I use the piano in this class um, most of the time so I kind of set that up and then I'll just have some music playing and then as the students come in usually I'll be handing back either some assignments or quizzes or we'll just jump right into running some exercises. Um, for the Butler class, one of the things that's really nice is that it's super low maintenance. I mean. I can get there really quickly, park, walk right into class and just start the class. I don't have to set anything up um, or walk very far after I've parked. Um, we just go there and, and we start and then I can leave right when we're done. I don't really have to do anything extra for this class. So in terms of the actual workload for each of these classes, um, I think about it mostly as designing a really good syllabus before the first class starts. That's where most of the work falls for me. And if I have this really organized plan laid out in my head and also on paper, then I find that the semester goes really smoothly. So in the case of the IU class, we have four different units um, that we cover and each unit has three tunes in it. So um, ultimately, they're trying to just memorize these tunes, the melodies, the chord changes, and being able to be able to solo over them. So we take different strategies and different approaches with this, but basically they're working towards doing a playing test, which they play for an AI for the class, so they don't actually play that for me, um, which is kind of nice too because I don't have to spend extra hours outside of the class um, working. But they work on these tunes through each class, and then as they're ready, they sign up on the AI sheet and then go meet with the AI, and then test out of these tunes. And then also, they have different assignments and quizzes that we do um, through the class. But basically, like if I get each class um, down on the syllabus, and 
if I get a plan as far as what I'm going to do during that class, um, it makes it a lot easier to sort of go with the flow because uh, the biggest challenge I think with that class is trying to work at a level where I'm not losing too many people, but I'm not boring too many people. So with the IU class, there's a fairly wide range of improv familiarity. And basically I'm trying to figure out a way where I can challenge everybody or people can sort of take it into their own hands where they add a, an element of difficulty to each little thing that we're working on to challenge themselves. Um, so as long as I have like a basic framework for each class or each unit and how I want to approach it and the things that I want to do, then it sort of allows me to go in the flow within each class. So if somebody has a question, we can go off course maybe for like five or 10 minutes and delve into a, a certain aspect that I hadn't planned on covering. But if the students are curious and we're able to stay on track with like the material we're covering, then I'm happy to go off course and, and just cover something. So that's one thing that's that I really love about it. It's really great because then they, they become even more engaged and interested and involved and people start participating more and 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 it becomes more interactive versus the thing I try to avoid is it, me just lecturing at the class. So with the IU class, basically they're playing their instruments the whole time and I'm trying not to talk too much, but a lot of times it's um, I'm demonstrating things on piano, they're playing it back to me or we're playing through patterns or um, just drilling certain chord changes or um, ear training exercises, all sorts of different things like that. Just to like hear chord changes, go through the memorization process and figure out a basic framework for improvisation that will work for each of them. So the Butler class, I would say, is even a little bit more free-flowing than the IU class. So with it just being a combo, just a performance group, I'm trying to have them play probably like 95% of the time. We'll play through a tune and then I'll give my two cents or give them something to try and then we'll try it again maybe with like a slight variation or trying to focus on one concept or one idea. And with this class, I've just set up a tune list so they have a tune each week. So the assignment and what they're graded on is memorizing the melody and the chord changes and being able to play it and improvise over it. So for that first week, they're learning the tune minority. And then for the second week, they are supposed to write a contrafact or their original melody over the chord changes to minority. So this is a composition exercise that I like to have them do throughout the semester in hopes that it will give them a deeper understanding of this particular set of chord changes. So when they try to write their own melody over it, it really makes them delve into the sound of the chord changes and find what their inner ear is actually hearing over these chord changes. So ultimately I'm hoping that we'll help them with their own improvisation so that then when they go back and they hear those chord changes out of context their ears are more attuned to it and then they're able to connect to what they're hearing in their head and then hopefully figure out how to play that on their instrument so one of the nice things about teaching students at the college level is that you know they've developed some sort of dedication to their craft or just learning music in general um, whereas if i'm teaching younger students like middle school or high school level students a lot of the times it's just their parents that have signed them up for lessons or they're just going like through the school program and they haven't necessarily made that choice for themselves. But when they're in college and they're playing an instrument and they've signed up for the class, they're usually more invested. So one of the great things for me is that then it gives me the ability to go deeper into particular topics and just work on concepts in a more thorough way where I can't necessarily do that if a student hasn't developed on their instrument to a certain level. One of the biggest challenges with teaching students at this level is finding a way to connect with each individual student in terms of their learning process. So with the IU class, there are about 18 students in the class and many of them do not speak English as their first language. So that's, that's a little bit of an issue, but the nice thing is that we're focusing on music and everybody speaks the language of music to some degree or another. So that is definitely a helpful thing in this case. Um, but what I have to keep in mind is that sometimes if I'm playing something, not everybody's hearing it in the same way. Some people can pick up a line and just play it right back to me. Some, some of them it takes just a little bit longer. Some of them it's useful for me to explain the theory behind it, whereas others either already know it or 
it wouldn't necessarily help them in that case. It, it might be better for some of them just to hear everything first and not think about the theory versus some of them want to know the theory behind every single little note right from the beginning or maybe even before we play through something. So just keeping that in mind and trying to find somewhat of a middle ground and also showing them that there are different approaches to learning this. So the, the other um, really hard thing is that I don't want to just do everything my way and just throw it all on them because I don't think it's necessarily the most useful. I like to get a little bit of feedback and interaction because then I can adjust what I'm doing and if I know that someone understands something in a different way or absorbs it better if I explain it this way, I would much rather do that than just do it, just explain it the way that I'm used to or how I'm comfortable doing it. Because that's the nice thing about it is with the Improvisation 1 class, um, the material is relatively basic for me just because I have more experience. So I can approach it in a lot of different ways and still meet the end goal that I wanna meet with the students. So in terms of pay with both schools, it ends up being about $40 per hour, which includes the travel time driving down to IU. So this is good in terms of um, having a steady paycheck for either a semester or an entire year. Um, the Butler class I'm doing um, runs all year. The IU class is just in the spring semester. So as a freelancer, it's nice to have this steady income for either a six month period of time or for a year, depending on what the class is like. I can make a little bit more um, teaching private students on my own or getting certain gigs. Um, so with like teaching private students, the average rate is around $60 an hour. And then with gigs, it can be more than that depending on what the gig is. But obviously, um, those are both less dependable. Even if I have a student um, who wants to take weekly lessons at my place, you know, they could get sick or they could have other school conflicts. So if they're supposed to have four lessons per month, they could miss one, two, three, or even four of them. And I don't really have any control over that. And then with gigs, you know, those can be hit, and, hit or miss too. People will call me for gigs or I might try to book gigs for myself, but it's really hard to plan how much I can actually make from that over like a six month period of time. So in terms of how I was able to actually book both of these jobs with these schools. So with the IU job, the head of the jazz department there is actually my old undergraduate saxophone teacher. Um, so he was aware that I was living in Indianapolis and freelancing and they had an opening for this position with this class last spring and so he asked me if I was interested in doing it. So I did it last spring and then now I'm in my second time doing this class. For the Butler job, the head of the department there is another saxophone player and we've actually played gigs together on and off for I guess about 10 years or so and so he's known me for a while and I think when I first started at Butler I was working with the youth program. so. They have um, programs during the spring, summer, and fall where um, professional musicians or faculty members at Butler will work with these students. Um, so I started doing that first and then gradually started uh, teaching there at the college level. So before I started working at each of these schools, I wasn't actually pursuing a college teaching job. Um, I just happened to be in a city where there were schools and there was a demand for teachers. So. Um, I guess it was mostly luck, but also having connections that I built starting many years ago that have just developed and continued. So in terms of actually applying to other schools and trying to get in, I'm probably not the best resource on that. I've, I've sent my application to probably less than five universities in maybe like 10 years of just trying to work as a freelancer. And I know that scene is very difficult to get into, um, especially with the requirements being more and more. A lot of times they will require that you have a doctorate um, or that you already have college teaching experience. And so it's something where it's a very gradual climb up the ladder in that sense. Um, and that's, I know it's getting harder and harder just from having friends that are um, pursuing that sort of thing. But I feel very fortunate just to um, have made the choice to live in Indianapolis and then the work was there and it sort of just came to me. 
um, and I didn't have to move anywhere for a part-time job that maybe didn't pay that great, but I'm able to just add this onto what I'm already doing as a freelancer. So I hope you found this video helpful. Please shoot me an email if you have any questions about any of this, and I'm happy to go into more details. I know there's probably a lot of things that I didn't cover, um, but I just wanted to cover the basics and maybe the things that I thought were the most important or interesting if you're somebody who is interested in maybe doing this type of work. So thank you for watching and I will see you next time.